Headlines for this week include, find out how the Eagles football team can help you save at the bookstore, at UWL's bookstore, a flu vaccine clinic comes to campus, and UWL, WTC, and Viterbo team up for events throughout the lacrosse community this weekend. Stay tuned, WMCM's Week in Review is next. Hello, and thanks for watching WMCM's Week in Review. I'm Gao Ji Yang. And I'm Haley Seitz. This past Tuesday, the UW Lacrosse Bookstore tried out something new called Touchdown Tuesdays. For every touchdown the Eagles football team scored in their game over the weekend, apparel and other merchandise in the store will be discounted by 5%. So, this past weekend, the Eagles won their homecoming game over UW Stout with four touchdowns, meaning on Tuesday, October 13th, everything was discounted by 20%. The next Tuesday that the bookstore will be celebrating touchdowns is October 27th. Keep in mind that the discount is applied to the entire purchase, in-store and online, of regularly priced clothing and gift items. While UWL students will still be happy with field goals or safeties, only touchdowns go towards the discount. For more details, go to www.uwlshop.com. Every flu season is different, which means that influenza can affect people in different ways. On October 20th, from 10 in the morning and 2.30 in the afternoon, in Porter Call Cartwright Center, UWL employees and their family members that are 18 years old and older are able to receive the vaccine at the flu shot clinic for little or no cost. For employees that have the Gunderson Health Plan and the Health Tradition Plan, the flu vaccine will be free of charge when they bring their insurance card with proof of their plan. For employees who do not have either plan through immunization by the Gunderson Health Plan, there will be a cost of $39 to receive the flu vaccine. Both checks and cash will be accepted. Lacrosse's flu season usually begins the second or third week in December, and it is best to receive the vaccine before that time. This week holds two speakers focusing on diversity and inclusion. Last night, Christopher Stewart Taylor, the Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator at the Ontario Ministry of the Attorney General, gave a presentation titled, Diversity and Inclusion, Anti-Black Racism and the Challenges of Diversity at Work. He discussed theories of diversity and inclusion and how they perpetuate anti-black racism in North America. The talk was part of the university's visiting scholar program and was sponsored by the History Department, College of Liberal Studies, Provost Office, and Multicultural Student Services Office. Tonight, following Taylor's lead, Diane Von Bienen, a researcher at the University of the Free State, South Africa, will lead a discussion on racism in higher education. Her topic is on scrutinizing mechanisms of subtle discrimination. After her talk, there will be a discussion that features Christopher Stewart Taylor, Tracy Littlejohn, the Ho-Chunk Nation Youth Services Homeschool Coordinator, and UWL faculty and staff. Diane's talk and discussion are free for students and will be located in Valhalla Cartwright Center. Yesterday, students took to the tennis tables to show off their ping pong skills. We sent out a WMCM crew to find out more. Students got the chance to test their table tennis skills yesterday at the 5th Annual Fall Paddle Battle Tournament located at the Eagle Rec Center. All students, faculty, and staff had the opportunity to register by noon yesterday for the chance to show off their ping pong powers. The lucky winner of the day won a championship shirt and a paddle battle trophy. And event coordinator Luke Marochinski explains that this is no ordinary intramural tournament. I guess one of the main reasons is because one, it's free, can't go wrong with that, and two, we actually don't offer an intramural ping pong sport. So this is like one of the only events for ping pong players to come out there and show what they got. The event was a double elimination tournament 
with more than 50 participants this year. A lot of people, a lot of good competition, I'm sure, so they better bring their A game and try their best, I suppose. <laughs> For WMCM TV, this has been Kevin Hulk, Lucas Morgan, and Alex Costello. Now here's Colin Malia to tell us about events happening around the lacrosse area this weekend. Thanks, Gauji. On Saturday, October 17th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., the third annual City Championship Volleyball Tournament will take place at the Rec. What's great about this tournament is that it's not only open to UWL students, but also to students from Viterbo and Western Tech as well. The 6 on 6 tournament is put on through a collaboration between the intramural programs of all three schools. Winners will receive a specialized City Championship t-shirt. Another event happening this Saturday is Make a Difference Day, an annual one-day national event held every October that celebrates service in local communities. This is also a tri-campus event coordinated between UWL, Viterbo, and Western Tech. Students will be meeting at Wigand Park on Cass Street at 11 in the morning and then will go to work on their projects from noon until 3 in the afternoon. Following the projects, there will be food, games, and prizes back at Wigand Park. Students will be making a great impact volunteering around the city throughout the day. Also coming up this week is a number of showings of Proof, a work that focuses on women's life as her father, um, a famous mathematician, is slowly losing his grip on reality. Proof considers not only the unpredictability of genius, but as well as the human instinct towards love and trust. See the show on October 16th and 17th at 7.30 in the evening and October 18th at 2, two o'clock in the afternoon. Tickets are $16 for adults, $14 for seniors and non-UWL students, and just $5 for UWL students. Proof will be performed at the Tallinn Theater, room 150 for the Center of the Arts. Now back to you, Gauji. UWL will be hosting a lecture by renowned scholar Renee Friedman, a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, who will be discussing discoveries found at an ancient Egyptian archaeological site. The topic that Friedman will be speaking on is the City of Falcon, Egypt's first capital and royal cemetery at Hierakonpolis, which will be held at 7 in the evening on Wednesday, October 21st in the Hesbrick Auditorium in Graf Main Hall. Admission is free to the public and anyone who attends will surely be fascinated by the artifacts that Friedman and her team discovered. Some of the artifacts that Friedman will be talking about include ivory combs, masks, and tombs. Friedman herself joined the team working at the Heraklionpolis in 1983 and became director of the Heraklionpolis expedition in 1996. Throughout her career, she, had, she has discovered ancient breweries, temples, and the elite cemetery. For more information, contact the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center at 608-785-8454. The Cooley Region Humane Society has many pets in need of loving homes. Here are some of the animals available in this week's edition of Perfect Pets. My name is Sissy. I'm a Yorkshire Terrier. I may be 11 years old, but my cuteness makes up for it. The name is Hollows. What you see is what you get. Hi, my name is Flash, and I'm a handsome six-year-old Border Collie with very good manners, and I need a home. Hey, I'm Warren. I've only been in this world for eight weeks, but I'm sure that one of these days my future family is going to come and take me home. To find out more about adoption for these pets or others, contact the Cooley Region Humane Society at 781-4014. Again, the phone number for the Cooley Region Humane Society is 781-4014. If you or anyone you know 
is looking to practice their karaoke or lip sync skills. Sports Management Association is putting on a battle of our night of fun complete with a karaoke and lip sync battle. There are no auditions to perform and there are 20 spots available on a first come first serve basis. Any student can register by getting a flyer from Kevin King's office in Mitchell Hall or by emailing Kaylee Ekstrom. So once the forms are completed and turned into Kevin King's office with the registration money, you will be good to go. The acts can be a solo, a duet, or with a group of up to four people. To watch the show, there is a $5 admission fee, which will go towards fundraising for their club. All students, faculty, and staff are invited to join and dress in 90s theme gear for the night. Kaylee Ekstrom, a member of SMA, said, I'm most excited about some surprises we have coming for the event, including a battle between some of our faculty members. Again, email Kaylee Ekstrom or go to Kevin King's office to get more information and a registration form. This past week, we sent a crew to Indigenous Peoples Day on UWL's campus, an alternative to Columbus Day that honors historical significance of Native American culture. Here's Luke Pierce, Tessa Tillett, and Ashley Wasson with the story. On Monday, October 12th, most people celebrate Columbus Day, but one student organization celebrates another group of people. Indigenous Peoples Day um, is usually known as Columbus Day. It um, falls on October 12th every year, um, and we just choose to, instead of celebrating Columbus Day um, as Native Americans, we choose to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. We take that time to um, really honor our ancestors and um, Mother Earth. NASA welcomed two influential speakers to the event. We also had the president of the Ho-Chunk Nation, um, and he came in and discussed just, or talked a little bit about um, La Crosse as a city um, and the traditional land that we are on, because residing here in La Crosse, we are um, on traditional Ho-Chunk land. The Native American Student Association brought in Wade Fernandez, a native performer, speaker, and educator. He is a musician, and he does um, a little bit of music playing and storytelling, and um, in between all that, um, gives educational bits and pieces like he did last night. So he'd play a little bit and then um, just talk um, very informally about um, who he is, where he comes from, um, as a from the Menominee Nation, and um, just doing what he can to um, talk more about Native Americans and um, as a whole, like as a population, Native Americans and. Um, also recognizing that there are many, many differences between different tribes and that um, we still are here. Members of NASA feel that the goal of Indigenous Peoples Day is to celebrate the importance of Native people in our history. Just to show that we are still here. I mean, Native Americans are known as um, like the invisible people um, just because we are always bypassed. This has been Tessa Tilot, Luke Paris, and Ashley Wasson reporting from Graf Main Hall, WMCM News. Originally from Los Angeles, California, the popular four-man band, Almost Classy, is being sponsored by CAB to come to UWL. They are set to perform their free show at 7 in the evening at Valhalla in Cartwright Center on Wednesday, October 21st. Because the members are from different places all around the country, their different musical backgrounds add hints of different genres in their music, such as rock, pop, folk, and hip-hop. The almost classy band are inspired by Mumford and Sons, Foster the People, The Beatles, and Foo Fighters. Tim Brosnan of Eclectic Ear on Almost Classy's EP said, This LA based quartet is hands down the best of the bunch. Almost Classy hits it out the park with this release. For more information, visit the Campus Activities Board's website at www.uw/slash cap. Each week, the WMCM crew goes out and talks to your fellow peers in a segment we call Campus Insight. This week, they ask students what's better, Pop-Tarts of Toaster or Toaster Studio. I'm Whitney Storvik for WMCM News, and today we'll be asking students the hard-hitting question of which is better, Pop-Tarts or Toaster Strudels? Absolutely Pop-Tarts. Pop-Tarts, Toaster strudels. That's so easy. Pop tarts, and it's the maple brown sugar kind for sure. So. Which are better, pop tarts or toaster strudels? Um, toaster strudels. Definitely pop tarts. Oh, toaster strudels. Thank you. 
Toaster strudels for sure. Which are better, Pop Tarts or Toaster strudels? Pop Tarts. And this has been a Campus Insight. I am Whitney Storbeck for WMCM News. Back to you guys. Look for the WMCM Cruise Campus for a chance to have your op opinions heard about next week's Campus Insight. And now here's me with a review of the movie Penguins of Madagascar. You all remember the best part of the DreamWorks animation movie Madagascar was the penguins. These characters, comic relief, has become so popular with fans, they now have their own movie called, incidentally, The Penguins of Madagascar. In this movie, we follow the four penguins, Skipper, Kowalski, Rico, and Private, and share in their adventures of covert operations and global espionage. In the film, the four join forces with an elite, undercover, interspecies protection agency called the North Wind to defeat the evil mad scientist, Dr. Octavius Brine. With an amazing cast of voice actors, a world-class animation studio, and a hilarious slew of characters, to keep you entertained, this movie is a great watch for kids and adults alike. Here's a look at the film's trailer. Attention, this is your captain speaking. You know the penguins of Madagascar, but what you don't know is they've been leading a double life as secret agents. <laughs> Their untold story began as four brothers. Are you my family? You don't have a family and we're all going to die. What? What's the matter with you, Kowalski? Who grew up to become masters of disguise, espionage, and aerial assault. Follow me, boys! We're going in hot. No one likes to show off, Private. Now, when it comes to stopping a madman... I have the power to destroy you. They'll have some competition. Break off the drone. What the heck is going on? Remain calm, Penguins. You are now under the protection of the North Wind. We don't even know who the heck you are. The North Wind is an elite undercover interspecies... The North Wind is an elite undercover... Task Force. Dedicated to help... Dedicated to helping animals who can't help themselves. Mm. This November... You got a soggy madman to stop. I give the orders around here. You were supposed to handcuff them. But they don't have hands. They just have flippers. And, and I have flippers. So it's flipping useless. When the world needs saving... After them! All right, boys. It's just like Cuba. Venice. Rio de Janeiro. Dusseldorf. We've arrived in the center of Dublin, Ireland. We gotta blend in. Riverdance. Heroes. We don't need these guys. Become legends. Penguins are our flesh and feathers. If anyone's gonna save us, it's us. From the creators of Madagascar. He hacked into our system. Debbie. Dave. Dave. Where's the sound? Dave, your microphone, it's not on. Click on the button with the picture of the microphone. Every time a villain calls in, this happens. Hello? Hello? Well, now we can so hear annoying. you, but every, we cannot uh, okay. see you. Every time. Oh, that's like talking to my parents. DreamWorks, Penguins of Madagascar. We need to find intel on Dave's location. All right, you, where's Dave? Give us the goods. Sir, that's a baby squid. <laughs> Sorry, laddie. <laughs> the movie hit theaters in November of 2014 and made a splash with audiences, but didn't do so well with the critics. Some claim the movie was too fast-paced and silly to have any depth. Well, obviously the movie's geared toward kids, so you got to keep them entertained. Fortunately, I'm still a child, so I love the movie. <laughs> but if there is something the movie can brag about, it's their all-star cast. Benedict Cumberbatch plays the Agent Classified, the leader of the North Wind, John Malkovich as Dr. Octavius Brine, and the men who have turned the Penguins into fan favorites, Tom McGrath, Chris Miller, Conrad Vernon, and Christopher Knights, respectively, as Skipper, Kowalski, Rico, and Private. Although the movie is not very original due to the fact that it's a spin-off, it makes up for that with sheer hilarity. Yes, all animated movies are filled with ridiculous pop culture references and silly antics, but The Penguins of Madagascar really does exceptionally with these. The fact that so much of the wordplay in the movie is intentionally, is intentionally grown-worthy makes this movie entertaining. The script, credited to John Abound, Michael Colton, and Brandon Sawyer gives the movie something special, making up for its lacking quality and dazzling animation. For those who find the humor, for those who find humor in ridiculous and silly, 
In The Ridiculous and Silly, this movie will serve you well. It's a good movie to relax and have a good laugh with. Check it out. You'll enjoy it. Stay tuned to WMCM's Joey Olson. We'll be back with this with Weekend's Weather. Lacrosse, I have a proposition for you. This weekend, you better find some time to get outside. Today, it was absolutely perfect. Today, it was a high of 64, and it'll be a low of 37. But going on into the weekend, just beautiful. 49 degrees, little windy, but no worries. Perfect for football or whatever you might be doing. Go to the apple patch. And then move it on to Saturday. It'll be a high of 54, mostly sunny again. Just absolutely perfect. And then moving on to Sunday, it's going to be sunny and a high of 61. Perfect weather. There might not be another weekend like this. So I'm telling you, lacrosse, you better find time to get outside. This is may be your last chance to enjoy this fall weather. And hey, that should sum it up for? from what's wow. going on in lacrosse. Nothing too, nothing too more important but it being perfect. And we will send it to John Chevalis for this week's interview. Thanks so much, Joey. So today I have with me my guest, Dr. Mark Chivalis of the History Department. Thank you for joining me, Mark. My pleasure. So what actually do you prefer to be called here on campus? What do you prefer your students to call you, doctor or? Well, a couple of years ago, uh, students asked me, do you want to be called doctor or mister? And I said, well, you know, I also have a master's degree, so perhaps you can call me master. <laughs> it hasn't worked out very well, though. Yeah, I imagine that. Yes. So, so what, then what kind of history do you actually teach on campus? What do you generally go for? Anything that nobody else wants to teach, but mostly that's ancient history, so anything even before the Greeks and the Romans, the Babylonians and the Sumerians, and even the Egyptians once in a while. Okay, going how far back would you say? How many years back? To the beginning of writing, so around 3,500 B.C. Well, that's pretty far back. I can't say that I know of any other professors that go quite that far back. Mm. So what really prompted you to teach to begin with? Uh, I loved this, to study this. It was my hobby, and then I found out that I could get paid for my hobby if I walked up in front of a, a classroom and started talking about it, so I decided it would be fun to be a teacher and tell people what I had learned. Okay, and how long did you actually go to school? How much did you have to learn in order to become a professor? Oh, much too long. Uh, <laughs> after the four years of, of, of being an undergraduate student, I went to graduate school, but it was not just one major. It was history, archaeology, and languages, and so I just went and went and went until my professor told me I was done. That ended up being 17 years later. That's not that years. typical. No, not entirely. I don't know of anyone here who's, you know, super seniors and all that, but I don't think anyone that I know of has taken 17 years in school. So what do you generally, how do you generally plan for your lectures? Well, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday when I'm not in class, I'm at home usually reading and thinking and studying and writing. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, I come in and talk about it. I suppose it's a little more sophisticated than that, but, but not much. But not much. Okay. I suppose if you're going to school for 17 years, you probably know the material fairly well. Well, I, I hope. But it keeps on changing. Everything, every time they dig something out of the ground, it contradicts what I thought I already knew. <laughs> okay. So then when you're actually grading like students' papers or exams, what kind of material or content are you looking for generally? Well, I tell the students, you really don't have to memorize the material. Just have the material become you. And that way, it'll, it'll stay with you forever. Now, I know that sounds a little ridiculous, but uh, I allow the student, I, I examine them on what they know and not on what they don't know. And so I really give them hopelessly vague questions to answer. Like, if the, if the class is about ancient Mesopotamia, I basically say, tell me everything you know about ancient Mesopotamia. And that gives them an opportunity to tell me everything they know about ancient Mesopotamia. Which, is that generally a lot or not quite so much? Well, it, I suppose it depends on the student. I'm, I'm being a little exaggerated here, I suppose, but not that much. Not that much, okay. No. So how long are your exams generally? How, what length do you generally look As for? long as the class is. So if as it's an 85 minute is. class, they have 85 minutes to tell me everything they possibly know. Just written exams then? Oh, yes. Is I there imagine. any other type of exam? <laughs> <laughs> to most professors, yeah. Most yes. of us are pretty pretty aware of multiple choice and all the fun that you can have with that. But I would actually have to prepare that exam. That would be hard. <laughs> that would be hard. Yes. So are you generally looking for a, a kind of easier way or just more? Do, what's your theory here? Are you looking for the way that you can learn what they've learned most or what? No, I think that if you examine this way in all seriousness, I, I find out actually what they have learned and what they have studied and what they know themselves. To me, uh, multiple choice and things like that is more like sampling, although I think I'm going to get in trouble now with, with uh, <laughs> other faculty don't watch this, do they? Um, <laughs> well, I think, I think that some probably do. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm hope hopefully you haven't stepped on too many toes there. Yeah. So, 
when, with your classes, though, do you ever, like, have fun with them? Do you ever, like, go for anything casual or, like, make any jokes with them or anything like that? Well, for example, this morning uh, I had students write an, an, an um, anonymous evaluation for me for five minutes. Those who came in late, I told the students, just th tell them that we're retaking the exam. Uh, and that was a problem, I suppose. All right. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming in today. And we are actually going to head over to Alec Bruss. He's going to be right back with sports this afternoon. And before that, though, we're going to take you again to look at those perfect pets. My name is Sissy. I'm a Yorkshire Terrier. I may be 11 years old, but my cuteness makes up for it. The name is Hollows. What you see is what you get. Hi, my name is Flash, and I'm a handsome six-year-old border collie with very good manners, and I need a home. Hey, I'm Warren. I've only been in this world for eight weeks, but I'm sure that one of these days my future family is going to come and take me home. To find out more about adoption for these pets or others, contact the Cooley Region Humane Society at 781-4014. Again, the phone number for the Cooley Region Humane Society is 781-4014. UW Lacrosse Women's Volleyball won last Friday over UW Stevens Point. The Pointers were ranked 13th in the American Volleyball Coaches Association's Top 25 poll. Jill Ettinger led UWL with 16 kills, while Jacqueline Barrett recorded 52 assists for the Eagles. UWL snapped a three-match losing streak and ended an eight-match losing streak to the UW Stevens Point. With this win, the Eagles improved to 13 and seven and three and one in the WIAC conference. Lacrosse returns to action tomorrow night, October 16th, hosting the UWL Invitational. The Eagles face Bethel University at 5 p.m. at Central College at 7:30. UW Lacrosse football won this past weekend over UW Stout in their WIAC home opener, 28 to 21. Quarterback John Tackett had 200. 47 passing yards and three touchdowns. Joel Oxton was the team's leading receiver with 11 passes, called for 143 yards and a touchdown. Running back Tyler Jenkins had 105 rushing yards and one touchdown. This was their fourth straight victory over UW Stout. With this victory, UW Lacrosse improved to 2 and 3 overall with a 1 and 1 record in the WIAC. The Eagles returned to action tomorrow against recently top-ranked UW Whitewater at 7 in the evening. Whitewater entered last week with the longest current win streak in the NCAA with 36 straight victories, but lost to UW Oshkosh 10-7. The Warhawks will come into this week with a lot of motivation after their recent loss. Whitewater will be a tough test for lacrosse this week. Earlier this week, I took a small crew from WMCM to help cover the UW lacrosse men's club soccer team as they prepare for a crucial contest this weekend against UW Platteville. spot in the regionals, we need to beat them by three goals, and if we do not do that, we're going to have to face a tough Madison squad on Sunday. However, if we win Friday by three goals and win Sunday, we secure our division, which will be an even bigger goal for us and huge success. Although UWL faces a difficult road ahead, Ander Bauman and company feel confident that they are on the right track to success this season. This is Alec Bruss, Evan Barrett, and Stefan Kluszewski from WMCM. Thanks for watching WMCM's Week in Review. Make sure, make sure to join us next week, Thursday at 4. Thursday at 4.30 right here on Campus Channel 6 and Charter Digital Channel 989. Thank you. Orchestral.